Welcome back, everybody. Now we're going to wrap up tonight with a talk about spruce disorders. You know, spruces are one of the most commonly planted trees in North Dakota. It is a great tree. It is so widely adapted. However, it does suffer from many insect pests, diseases, and other types of disorders. So tonight, we've got a leading, if not, I would say the leading tree doctor. If you had a sick tree, this is the person you would want to consult. Joe Zelaznik, no, no. extension for our okay, but... no, I'm quite serious. And you will get his, you know his email. So just gave some more work there, Joe. No, Joe is really, he is the expert when people have a question about how to care for a tree under stress. And we're very fortunate to have Joe here tonight. So let's welcome Joe to the forum. Okay, well, thanks, Tom. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. True. It's, it's true. very humbling. Thank you. All right, uh, are we up? Okay, well, thanks for having me here tonight. I hope I can teach you something about spruce trees and all the disorders they, they suffer or can suffer here in North Dakota. I do want to point out this presentation is based in part on a recent publication that came out last year diagnosing spruce disorders in North Dakota. It was put together by myself and Aaron Bergdahl of the North Dakota Forest Service. Should I hold this up in front of the camera? Okay. Right there. All right. There it is. Okay, very good. Uh, I'm going to add a few things to this presentation that aren't in here, and there are a few very rare or very uncommon uh, pest disorders that I'm not going to cover tonight. But there's more information in this document if you're interested and another document I'm going to refer to. So uh, that being said, I have di diagnosing spruce disorders, mostly spruce. Some of the examples I'm going to give are uh, include pine trees because there are some pests that hit both pine and spruce. So we'll cover that here tonight. Uh, just very briefly, there's, there are a couple that are time sensitive. You will see at certain times of the year. We're going to cover those first. And then there are other disorders that you will see just about any time of year. So very quickly, we'll get into winter injury. Winter injury is number one. Uh, winter injury is kind of a vague term. There are a lot of things that can happen to trees over the winter. Uh, it gets awfully cold here, and then it gets awfully warm and cold again in the spring. And you combine those factors, and it's really tough on trees. So winter injury, it can show up like this. Uh, on this spruce tree, this is a photo from Mike Kangas, North Dakota Forest Service. Uh, I can show up like this. This is another photo from Aaron Bergdahl, North Dakota Forest Service. So the symptoms you're going to see are pretty variable. The thing is, they show up now. They show up near the end of winter. Uh, actually, this winter hasn't been too bad, so we might not see much of it this year. And Sometimes there's a pattern. Obviously, these aren't spruce. These are pines in the foreground. And everything above the snowpack uh, was killed. All the needles above the snowpack were killed. All the needles below that were protected by the snow were not killed. So this is another type of winter injury. Obviously, this example is pines. Uh, same on this pine. Very low to the ground where there was snow, those needles were fine. Above, uh, above the snow line, they're, I don't want to say toast. I don't want to get too technical. but uh, they're they're hurting. Uh, in this example, kind of more damage on the right side of those trees than on the left. That was more of a wind issue, or this one could have been road salt, actually. Uh, hard to say based on this location. These are white pine trees. This is over in Minnesota. And sometimes there isn't a pattern. Sometimes it's pretty random. Uh, in this pine, you might see a need some needles are dead. Some are alive. Some are dead on the bottoms of the branches, some on the top. Uh, so it's really variable. And about the only thing you can do for winter injury after the fact is sit and wait. Wait it out. In this example, you can see where the red arrows are, that's where new growth is coming out. The buds were not killed. The, the needles were, but the buds were not. So in that case, where those red arrows are, new growth is coming. So you just wait it out. But you'll also notice where the black arrows are, those buds are not growing. Uh, chances are they did die. So it's really variable. So that's about all you can do after the fact. Uh, before the fact, 
actually in the fall, watering from about mid-September until freeze up is what you can do to, I don't want to say prevent, but at least minimize winter injury. Having trees go into winter well hydrated is uh, about the best you can do to prevent winter injury. Obviously, if you have little shrubs, uh, you could use some kind of uh, burlap or other type of something, other type of material to protect them, keep them out of the wind, keep the winter sun off them. But for a big tree, you can't do that. The other time sensitive pest I want to mention is yellow headed spruce sawfly, YHSS. What you're going to find here, you need to look at this in uh, early to mid June, and you need to start scouting, well, in early June. This pest shows up mostly in central and western North Dakota. I don't know that I've really seen it that far east. I've seen it from Devil's Lake down to Richardton, so everything in between. And with this, you might see twisted needles or, or half-eaten needles. Or in this case, you could see the needles have started to turn pink and have started to actually kind of shrivel up. So that's one of the symptoms of yellowhead spruce sawfly. In the, on the right-hand side, and kind of towards the background, but on the right-hand side of this photo, you see there's one branch that most of the needles are gone. And that's what the, the insect does. It, it can either chew just a little bit off the base and kill the needle, or it can eat the whole needle. And this is a caterpillar, yellow-headed spruce sawfly. And here's the thing about this insect. Yeah, that, that head doesn't look kind of doesn't look yellow. It looks a little more reddish orange to me. And yeah, sometimes they're like that. However, the interesting thing with this is it's really not a tough caterpillar. It's uh, it's pretty sensitive to to the chemical uh, to insecticide control. It's very easily controlled by insecticide if the timing is right. You have to have the insect there. There's a window for about four weeks. Look for it. Find it. Scout. You have to be out there and find it. And then, yeah, most insecticides will take care of it. But if you spray too early or you spray too late, that's just a waste of money. So that is yellow-headed spruce sawfly. Uh, keep an eye out for that in starting in early June. Okay. Oh, and there we go. Control. Well, there we go. It's everything I just said right there in, in two lines. Timing is critical. Okay. As we move on, we're going to talk about spruce disorders. You're going to see at any time of the year. And I want to add a little caveat. Any time of the year for diagnosis. Okay. You're going to see these a lot different times of the year. But the treatment is often time sensitive. Uh, there's an insect pest that you can see this every month of the year. It's always there. Treatment for it is really time sensitive. We'll talk about that. Okay. But first, we'll talk about the needle cast diseases. Okay. Needle cast diseases are going to show symptoms like this. See, the bottom branches are bare. The interiors of the tree is, is bare. Uh, if you look at an individual branch, you might see something like this, where the most recent year of growth there on the right, the last year of growth, the needles look fine, and then you go in one year, and the needles are still there. You go in to the, to the third year needles, they're mostly gone. Fourth year needles are totally gone. So you need to look at the different age class of needles. Okay. Uh, the first year should always be the second year. Uh, second age class there, they might already be affected. If they're affected, if they're infected, excuse me, uh, that's going to be really tough on the tree. Third year and older, that's going to be tough as well. Spruce trees should hold their needles for three to seven years. Sometimes, and, and close, I would say closer to that seven. Uh, usually I'd say five to seven. But they should hold several years worth of needles. And if they're losing them, that could be a problem. So the lower needles are more affected, as I've said. But here's the question. Very simply, how can you tell the difference between a needle cast disease and, you know, just simply the effects of shade? As trees get older though, and grow bigger, those older needles towards the center of the tree get shaded out. That's why the tree lets them go. How can you tell the difference? You can tell the difference 
by these fungal fruiting bodies. Okay, these are on the needles. This, these are photos really close up of the needles. And those little dark dots are fungal fruiting bodies. On the right is a fungal disease called Rhizosphera. On the left is one called Stigmina. And it's really hard to tell the difference. Um, we'll talk about that in a moment. Normal needles, all those stomates, stomates are the little pores in the needles. They're just nice little line. They should be white. They should be white. Uh, you can see in those bottom photos, some of them are white, but mostly they're black. Those are the fungal fruiting bodies. Okay, so that's how you tell the difference between uh, a branch that got shaded or needles that just got shaded out because they're not going to have those black fruiting bodies. Okay. The way you tell the difference between these two diseases, it's very simple. Uh, stigmina, those fungal fruiting bodies, they're kind of fuzzy edges on them. Uh, it's obviously you can see it in this in this photograph. With a 10 power, 10x hand lens, you should be able to see it. Might be a little tough. Uh, you might need to get it under a microscope. But if you see those fuzzy edges to those fruiting bodies, that's stigmina. Rhizosphera, there are smooth edges. Um, over the last few years, it seems like stigmina has kind of kicked out rhizosphera. Rhizosphera used to be the, the most common uh, of the needle cast diseases, but it seems like stigmina has kind of taken over. And replaced it. Uh, in terms of control, rhizosphera, we all, it was it wasn't easy, but it was pretty straightforward. Uh, chemical control two times early in the season. Uh, first is when the needles are about half elongated, and the second would be three to four weeks later. As a rough rule of thumb, it was Memorial Day and Fourth of July. A eh, rough rule of thumb. Um, as we move more towards this uh, stigmina. It seems like that four week, uh, oh, and sorry, let me back up with rhizosphera, that two time treatment, Memorial Day, 4th of July, you would need to do that in two consecutive years. And that would work to prevent future infections, or at least minimize. It'd be, it's really good at that. With stigmina, it's kind of an ongoing battle. Uh, yes, there's a, there are those two applications, but it has to be continued throughout the growing season for three or four or five applications, depending on the weather, uh, and several years in a row, more than just those two years. Uh, we really need more research on it, but that's uh, that's our recommendations right now, based on our experience. So uh, it's it's a tough disease to treat. We find this mostly where it's wet. Uh, I just in the Devil's Lake area all over the place. Um, as you get further west, it it lessens, it, it, it tends to decline uh, west, uh, west of 83 or 85 that goes from Bismarck to Minot. 83. 83, I always forget. Uh, 83, west of 83, it, uh, I've seen it a few times. It's not nearly as common as it is east of there. Okay, and if you're looking for more information about this, uh, our extension publication, F1680, has more information about the needle cast diseases. All right. Another one you, you can see just about any time of year is Valsa canker. We used to call it Cytospora canker. I think we're going to be in this transition mode uh, for about the next 10 years because we've sold Cytospora canker for so long. So it's called Valsa now. Uh, this one is interesting because it's just individual branches. Whole branches are going to die. An entire branch is going to die in this disease. Um, and that's one of the key diagnostics, but not the key diagnostic, because, you know, a branch can die because of a lot of different things. Uh, it could just have had too much snow on it, for example, and it broke. Okay, just physical cracking uh, could have been, I don't know, squirrels Squirrels eat branches sometimes. Yeah. Nah, not, not so much fruit, though. Yeah. yeah. Not yeah. Uh, but here's an example. Uh, on the left, that tree, I took that photo in 2005. The branch on the left of the left photo with the green arrow, the color was a little bit off. And it caught my eye, so I took that photo. And you can see a year later in May 2006, the entire branch is dead. Now, also on that tree on the left, in the red arrow, it's pointing to a branch that looks really healthy. 
and is really healthy. A year later, totally gone. Well, geez, what's happened there? The key diagnostic for Valsa canker is these fungal fruiting bodies that you find just under the outer bark, just in the inner bark. Uh, that's the key diagnostic. And it's really hard to see sometimes. Uh, basically, treatment is very simple. Remove dead branches and destroy them, burn them, chip them, uh, preferably burn. And keep the trees properly watered. Balsa is a really interesting fungus in that it's really associated with moisture. Uh, if the tree gets drought stressed, if a spruce gets drought stressed, it's very sensitive to this disease. Uh, the flip side of it is don't overwater tree, overwater spruces because they're pretty sensitive to flooding. See, I'm so, it's hard to talk to an online audience because I'm so used to saying, any questions out there? I know we're saving well, questions till yeah, the end. They're coming, Joe. Okay. Lots of them for you. All right. Lots of information on <laughs> spruce spider mites. Uh, you see needles like this, where the needles get a mottled appearance, mottled appearance, uh, where they, they're usually green, but there are these patches of yellow or tan. Uh, you'll notice, again, this going back to another issue, stomates, the stomates here are all white. There's no needle cast on this. And the spruce spider mites are tiny. Oh my gosh, they're small. Um, this is, I'm so glad Aaron got this photo of that insect. So it's a cool season mite. Above about 80 degrees, it goes dormant. It, so it's active early in the season, it's active late in the season. Incredibly small. Uh, hard, hard to see. Cultural control works pretty well. Just spray a jet of water on there, knock them off of the chemical control. Uh, they are mites. They are not insects. They're more closely related to spiders. Okay, so there's a, a certain class of pesticide called a miticide, and they will kill spruce spider mites. However, they'll also kill predatory mites. Some mites will eat plants, and some mites will eat other mites and insects. So, got to weigh that. Um, timing is critical. Again, it's an early, it's either early season or late season. Um, and get out there and try to find them. Uh, an easy way to do this is take a, a white piece of paper and put it under the branch, shake the branch, and see if there are little black specks moving around on the, on the piece of paper. Uh, I've also heard of the smear test where you get those black specks <laughs> and you run your finger across them and see if they smear on the paper. Um, crude but effective. Okay, spruce spider mites. Uh, pine needle scale, this is one of those you're going to see at any time of the year. This is an insect pest that hits pine trees, as you can see in the photo on the top, but also spruce trees. I've seen them right, uh, right next to each other in the same shelter belt, a pine tree and a spruce tree, and they both have pine needle scale. It's a tiny insect. Uh, that you see those white uh, coverings any time of year. And that's the, the eggs are under there. The mama scale has created that safe zone for the eggs uh, to hatch, for, uh, for the eggs to hatch and create the crawlers. And the crawler stage is from May to early June. <clears throat> so again, timing is critical. Um, Yes, horticultural oils may work. Insecticides, there are many that will control scale insects. But again, timing is critical. You have to be out there when the, the crawlers are out. That's when the chemical has to be applied or the treatment has to be applied. So scouting, scouting, scouting is important. Okay, a few more I have listed as other. These are more environmental things um, that may or may not actually be in our, our diagnostic guide. Uh, I, this is a pine tree. Uh, in this example, it was rodent damage. It was voles that killed this tree. But I've also seen where the whole tree dies because of a line trimmer has pretty much girdled the tree. So what do you do in situations like this? You cut the tree down. There is nothing you can do, um, unfortunately. But if the whole tree goes all at once, then check at the base of the tree. Check right on the stem where it hits the ground and see if it's been girdled. Another thing that might happen on the site is the site. Uh, for example, in 2012 in Bismarck, this tree is kind of on its way out, unfortunately. And it's sitting right in a pool of water. 2012 was a big 
Bismarck flood, just like these trees. Okay, um, some of them are already dead. One of them is not. People say, "Well, why didn't that tree die?" Who knows? Uh, genetics. You know, maybe that one's just a little more resistant. It's a little bit bigger. Maybe it's age. Uh, maybe it's a site thing. But I would be willing to bet that maybe that tree lasted a little while longer, but I'd be willing to bet that it's dead. Uh, for the areas in Minot that were flooded in 2011, uh, you'll be hard-pressed to find any conifers in that area right now that survived the flood. There are a few, but they're few and far between. Okay, here's another example uh, from Kindred, 2006. My, my old boss said, hey, he left a branch, spruce branch on my desk. said, hey, Joe, what's wrong with this tree? It's killed this one tree, and it's going down the line. It was a dead branch. I didn't know. So I, signed, I went out to the site, and this is what I saw on the first tree. And there it is. If you go to the left, that tree is in decline somewhat. And if you keep going down the line, well, further away, the trees are healthy. Okay, so yeah, he was right. It's starting at one end, going down the line towards the other. And I go back to that first photo, and I knew exactly what it was right away. Look at the house behind it. The house is about four to six feet higher than the driveway. And that house was pretty new. So what happened was they built a new house. They graded the, the ground and put in a lot of fill soil. Okay, spruce trees cannot handle fill soil. They can't handle flooding either. It's a low oxygen environment. So that's what was killing the tree. Uh, yes, insects came in and probably some disease and finished the tree off, but really it was that fill soil that caused the, dec the initial decline, the initial stress that allowed these other pests to come in and kill the tree. Okay. That was other, and now we're into more other. Um, these are some smaller trees I saw in Fargo, I want to say in 09. And where I have those arrows on that individual tree, there's something different between the top of the tree and the bottom of the tree there. The bottom, it looks more full, a little more green. Above those arrows, it's a little more yellow and a little more thin. Uh, it's a subtle difference. A subtle difference you have to have the artist's eye to see this and you know in the background i've got sky in the background of the photo and lawn in the background and it's hard to see but there is a subtle difference below those arrows it's fuller it's darker above it's more yellow and a little more open so i looked at the stem right in that area and that's what i found okay the strap was still on the tree. Many years later, it was choking the tree, it was girdling the tree, and there was a, a big swelling above that where all the food made from photosynthesis was piling up. And uh, I went back a year later to go check on those trees, they were gone. So what can you do? But on, along the same lines, here's a big, big spruce tree where, same thing, same idea. And that, that tree's enormous. Uh, there's something happened on the stem at about that height. In this case, it was sap suckers. Blew me away. Couldn't believe it. Uh, sap sucker is a bird. You cannot kill it legally. Do not. Uh, they are a type of woodpecker. They're not going after insects. They're going after sap. Uh, there's not a whole lot you can do about sap suckers. And unfortunately, we always see this damage after the fact. And uh, I'm working on my own apple tree at home right now. Those buggers took out my apple tree. So trying to figure out how to fix that. Okay. Uh, and that's going from more other to more extra other. A uh, couple of other things before we finish up here. Uh, herbicide damage. Herbicide damage on spruce trees is sometimes hard to diagnose. Sometimes it's pretty clear. We often see damage on conifers going up the tree in a kind of a spiral. That's the way water goes up conifer stems, is actually it spirals up the stem. Other trees are different, how water moves up the stem. Well, if uh, water, if herbicide is in that water, it will spiral up and kill branches along the way. Um, 
and sometimes it takes a, an artist's eye to see that spiral. Sometimes it's hard to see, sometimes it's not. Uh, in this case, I don't know what the what the causal agent was. This was over in Moorhead. Uh, there was uh, a railroad siding there, and some kind of herbicide was sprayed to keep down the keep down the uh, vegetation. And what happened is, well, the spruce took some of that in, and it turned those outer needles yellow. Uh, here on campus, NDSU campus, and that fence in the foreground, somebody was spraying to keep down the vegetation, and I never quite figured out what the chemical, what the active ingredient was that was there. Uh, this was in Hedinger a few years ago, and I, we tried to figure out what was sprayed. Some, someone said it was Roundup or glyphosate. Some said it was 2,4-D, but we were never quite clear. In this case, the color uh, was interesting. It was more of this purplish pink. But what we noticed, uh, besides the purplish pink, is you'll notice that it's always the branch tips. It's the active growing points, or most recently active growing points, where you're going to find that damage. And in some cases, it starts to twist the needles. Uh, there's also a a pest called a phytoplasma that may twist the needles in a similar way. We're still trying to figure that one out as well. But in this case, with all the other herbicide damage, we're pretty sure that's what caused the, the damage here. So that being said, mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to go through that fairly quickly. There's a lot of information there. But I'd be happy to do my best to answer some of your questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Joel. We got some questions here for you. One is um, deer are browsing on a mugle pine. The needles are gone, but the buds are still there. Will the branches survive? The branches should survive. Uh, if the buds are there, they, that's where new growth is coming from. And hopefully there's enough new growth to make up for the amount of needles that were lost. Um, again, you're just gonna have to wait it out and find out. Uh, I think, well, they should be okay, but we'll see what happens. How about uh, the spruce tree? The top got broken off. Will the spruce tree still grow? Yes, it will. The spruce will still grow. However, uh, with the top broken off, it's hard to say. If it's a small tree or if it's just the very tip, the very leader, like you know, one or two years worth of growth, a side branch can be tipped up either on its own or you can help it along. Uh, if it's a large two, three, eight inches diameter, a side branch eventually will make its way up to become the leader or actually several side branches, which is going to create a point where structurally it's going to be weakened. Uh, if it's something you can direct a new leader, uh, great, do that. If, if not, well, be careful uh, in the future. Okay, Joe, how about... The difference between the rhizosphera and the stigmina, fruiting bodies. Is there a way to tell the difference between the two? Sure. Yeah, stigmina, you need to, it's, it's subtle, but you can see it under a microscope or with a 10 power hand lens. With the stigmina, the, the edges of that fruiting body are going to be fuzzy. They're going to be blurry. Um, there are little tendrils that come off of those, little hair-like hair structures. With with rhizosphera, it's pretty much round without the fuzz. And they're all going to be, they're both those fruiting bodies are going to be linear on the needle in the... In those stomates, yes. Stomates. They're laid out right. in a line. So yep. you have to look at those black dots carefully, <laughs> like Joe said. Okay, let's say they have stigmina or rhizosphera. Do you recommend a fungicide for that? Uh, yes, fungicides with the active ingredient chlorothalonil. Yeah, I guess I should have added that. Uh, sorry about that. Great question. Chlorothalonil. There are a variety of products that have chlorothalonil as the active ingredient. Uh, look those up. How do those disease, those needle cast diseases spread? Uh, the needle cast diseases spread, the, the spores get released. Uh, I think throughout the year, but mostly it's early in the growing season, and uh, they get spread. And if the if the new growth is susceptible or receptive, that's when they can get infected. 
It's that new growth that's still soft and tender that is most susceptible. Later in the growing season, they're, they're, they're hardened up. They're less susceptible, less likely to get infected, although it can still happen. Okay, if, the, if an ice storm breaks off the branches on one side of a tree, will that side of the tree ever grow back? If an ice storm breaks off the branches on one side, on of, the side tree, of the tree, well, uh, probably not. <laughs> but that being said, there, there's sometimes, sometimes trees will put out new branches off the stem. Uh, I've seen where if trees are heavily, heavily pruned or heavily, heavily stressed, they will send out new branches off the stem. Uh, looks a little weird, but it can happen. And it can, yeah, it can for grow. a long, long For a long, long, long time. Maybe it could take a long. long time to fill in. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, um, what's the latest verdict about using Roundup at the base of a tree trunk to keep the grass away? The latest verdict. Um, you know, there's some research that's, oh, there's no easy answer yet. Uh, sometimes Roundup does get into the, the trees. Uh, sometimes it'll get into a root or into the stem, and it can cause some damage. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, be, be careful. Use it properly. Use it according to the label. Try to keep it off the tree stem if you can. Uh, if there's a wound on that tree stem or on a root, yeah, it'll get in from that wound, that fresh wound. So try to keep those. So how about does a copper fungus spray work to get rid of black fungus growth on a small new blue stem, blue spruce totem? Blue spruce totem, like a totem pole. Uh, I, see if I don't see, know. If you see black fungus growth on a young blue spruce, you know, what do you think that is? I, like sooty mold, maybe? It could be. You know, fungicides <clears throat> are almost always preventative. They're not curative. Uh, so in, in cases like that, you know, after the fact, it's probably not going to do much. It might prevent new infections, and that would be a way to go. Now, I'm also going to say at this point that, you know, um, you know, it's hard to answer questions, you know, because usually when you do a diagnosis, it, 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 it's not just like give Joe 20 words and here's your answer. <laughs> it's not Twitter. Photos help. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, you know, we are in the age of a digital camera and it can make such a huge difference. Sure. So take a, take a series of photos, you know, close-ups, distant photos. And uh, send them to your, your county extension agent. They're there to help you um, for any type of tree disorder. And then Joe is also there to support the county agent and to support you to give you the answers you need. And the, in our digital age, you can get an answer rapidly and you get you know, research-based information from NDSU extension. We won't try to sell you a fungicide that you don't need, for example. Um, so I don't know if you can do this one. Can can you use well water at a pH eight, sodium level eight hundred ppm to help establish spruce or pine? That's mm. a pretty specific question. But how about yeah. maybe you can talk about in general about the the salt tolerance of spruce or pine compared yeah. to most other plants? You know, uh, salt tolerance. Really, there's not a lot of plants, not a lot of trees that are salt tolerant. Um, and using water like that, I would say you could use it in an emergency. But if you've got, if you can get better water than that, that's a pretty high salt level. Um, yeah, yeah. The uh, I'm not so worried about the pH. Yeah, our pH of our our water is a little high. The pH of our soil is a little high. Uh, the spruces that we have here which are Colorado blue spruce, Black Hill spruce, uh, Meyer spruce a little bit, and in urban areas you see Norway spruce, they do tolerate our higher pH soils fairly well. Okay, how about, do you, do you know of any public tours of trees at Absaraca? 
pay um, attention to the field day. Yeah, pay attention to the field, field day, LBO August. Field day, no. Yeah. You can just Google Early that. August. You can get yeah. us every year is a field day. And mm -hmm. actually, the people you had here tonight mm -hmm. are the people who will lead those tours. Yes. Um, when you prune for balsa canker, do you prune the whole branch if only part of the branch is affected? Or you just prune the part that's affected? Pr prune the part that's affected. If it's a sub branch of the main branch, yeah, you can take out just the dead area. Uh, that may, if that doesn't work, then you can go all the way back to the main stem. How about a chemical name to control pine needle scale? Pine needle scale, there's and horticultural oils. Yeah, horticultural oils, but there are a lot of insecticides that will control scale if the timing is right. You know, imidacloprid as a um, Systemic. Systemic, thank you. It is early work. spring, you'll get it. It is early spring, yeah. <laughs> uh, Midacloprid <laughs> as a systemic does control scale, but under the right circumstances, um, carbaryl, carbaryl yeah. which is yeah. also systemic, um, can be sprayed. I'm thinking, wow, and malathion. Malathion. Malathion will work. If you get it when the, when the crawlers, when the crawlers when are out, out at the right time. Yes. Uh, okay, a general cultural question. They have uh, they have several 20-foot-tall Colorado spruce trees planted in late September. Should they fertilize them in spring? I'm not a big fan of fertilizing trees in North Dakota. Generally, there's plenty of nutrients in our soil. Uh, if you are going to fertilize, spring is the time to do it. But really, the, the most limiting factor here in North Dakota is water. You know, that's the that's the biggest issue, far and above the nutrient issue. And the 20-foot tall Colorado spruce tree planted in in late September. Planted in late September. Oh, boy, I hope that had a big root system as part of it. You know, yeah, reestablishing that root system cool. is really critical. And water is going to be the... Severe shock. Yes, water is going to be the critical component to get those roots reestablished. Okay, here's something that's useful. A real useful question that there's kind of like the idea that cutting off the leader is going to make your spruce tree fuller is that true do you recommend doing that i don't recommend doing it uh <laughs> it can make it bushier you know uh, when they when they share christmas trees spruce trees yeah they will clip the leader and clip the leaders of the branches but that being said boy i wish i was able to do uh have some diagrams here spruce trees are interesting in that on the can you see my finger? Okay. Uh, buds on spruce trees are all throughout that leading branch. So if you clip just the top off, there are other there should be other buds below that that will take over, that will kind of compete to be the leader. So it'll make it bushier, but what you'll lose, and that's okay if you're growing a seven or eight foot or ten foot uh, Christmas tree. But what you'll lose in the long run is you'll you'll lose a central leader. You'll have multiple leaders coming off, and, and years down the road, that's a bad thing. Right. So we generally do not recommend no. shearing your landscape trees for spruces. How about uh, this lawn care company said that they can spray something on their spruce tree to help protect the tree winter? Okay. What do you think about that? There are products called anti-transparents. Those pores in the needles, there's those stomate pores. That's where a number of things happen, but that's where trees lose water. And an anti-transparent, it's called transpiration when they lose water. So an anti-transparent is basically a waxy coating that plugs up those pores. They've been kind of hit or miss here in North Dakota. They're, they work for about three months. You have to apply them when temperatures are above freezing so you apply it in october okay so three months later is november december january january it generally is not above freezing in north dakota um, if you can time it right find that midwinter thaw you might be able to do it and it might help but um, it's going to be tough Okay, Joe, that is going to be it. So thank you, Super. Joe, for that outstanding presentation. And all oh, it's sorry, you got one person. Just oh. can. Uh, how do you get rid of spiders on a blue spruce? Well, they spiders or spider mites. Yeah. I, I'm okay with spiders. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. But spiders, they're generally they're beneficial. They're, they're eating so, the insects. Yeah, they're good yeah. things. Don't worry about that. Spider yeah. mites. Spider mites. There's those mites. Mites. But you also said jet spray of water is the common spray way to control. Yeah. Just use a jet spray of water in yeah. most cases. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay. Thank you, Joseph. You're welcome.